My name is uh, Sylvain Gillier and I'm uh, really happy to welcome you to this uh, online uh, summit, Healing and Reconnecting with the Horses. I'm living near Chartres in France and I've been practicing um, equine assisted therapies for almost 20 years now. And I really believe that the field of equine facilitated learning is really changing faster and faster. And uh, especially after these last uh, three years. So I had this uh, intuition while I was riding my horses to organize this online summit. And it's three days, so it's December 14th, 15th, and uh, 16th. And the uh, agenda, the complete detailed agenda is right here. Um, so it's completely free, it's free of charge. And uh, for those who cannot be with us live, so you can watch the replay, it's, it's still free of charge, but you will have to subscribe to our YouTube channel and the address is right here. So welcome to this uh, online summit. And uh, today we are really happy to welcome Dr. Nicole Arts. Um, Nicole is a medical doctor and she is the creator of Monarch Equine Facilitated Learning and that's an equine mediation program for hospital interns and medical students. So welcome Nicole. Okay, so hello Nicole. It's a big pleasure to have you at this uh, summit. And um, so we, we met uh, during the HippoNoquest apprenticeship with uh, Linda Kohanov. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm really thrilled to, west, to welcome you as a, as a, as a colleague. And, um, and uh, so uh, you, you are a medical doctor. Um, you're working right now in the United States. You are in uh, Iowa. Um, you've been working. Sorry? I'm in Missouri. I'm in Missouri now. Oh, you're in Missouri now. All yeah. right. Okay. And um, so it's been a few years since we, we met. Uh, and um, uh, maybe could you um, say a few words about yourself, who you are for our, our audience? Yeah, you bet. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I'm a, a physician. Um, I uh, worked mostly in the hospital setting and um, in palliative care currently. Um, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to attend a workshop by Linda Kohanov in Arizona, and yeah. I found it so helpful. Um, it really helped me uh, just work on some of my relationships with um, our director and, and other colleagues at work where I was working um, at the time. And, um, mostly by just helping me shift my perspective on things. Uh, so it was sort of internal changes that allowed me to see things from a different point of view and thought that was just so beneficial that I think I went back for another workshop and then I decided to do the equine assisted learning apprenticeship program where you were our small group leader and that's how I met you. Um, and that was just a tremendous growth opportunity that kind of like you know, one of those early dominoes that starts this whole cascade of um, changes and learning and growth. And so um, it's just been really amazing um, since that time. Um, and more recently, really, as kind of as a, um, I think all of it's connected, but more recently I've decided to, um, I found myself back in Arizona um, doing an integrative medicine fellowship. And so um, that's sort of my latest adventure, but um, along the way, after completing that equine assisted learning apprenticeship, one of the ways in which I wanted to um, to utilize those um, concepts and skills that I was learning was to bring it back to um, medical students and residents and um, and other practitioners in the field of medicine, so physicians and nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants, um, and just uh, I thought a lot of the um, concepts and uh, skills were were just uh, really useful, um, or would be really useful for 
for all of us in the field of medicine. So yeah, so that's what led me to develop um, the program uh, and eventually to publish the paper. Wow, yeah, that's that's awesome. And uh, if I um, remember well, um, your your background is is in the is it in palliative care? Um, it is most recently. I actually initially was working as a hospitalist, and then I yeah I. I kind of got interested in adults with sickle cell disease, and so I really focused on that for a while and developed a program um, working with um, patients who had sickle cell, and um, that was an amazing opportunity. I really I loved doing that, and um, and through that work, I became interested in um, in palliative uh, because a lot of my patients had you know really severe chronic organ damage from their disease and were. Um, dying, and I, I felt very uncomfortable with that, and with how to talk to them about that, and um, so yeah, so it's just been an interesting journey <laughs> throughout my career. Um, now yes. I find myself working in palliative and um, and learning more uh, integrative medicine skills. Yeah, that's that's amazing. That's amazing, and um, yeah, so um, we're we're all. Um, Talking about evidence-based medicine in the in the medical field, pretty much everywhere, would it be in France, in everywhere in Europe, or in the U.S. of course, and uh, uh, and and so, but there is uh, integrative medicine. That's that's um, that's sure. Um, so, would you would you say uh, that? Um, Horses and the work with horses is part of a, an integrative approach, or, or how, how, how do you, yeah, how do you locate this work with with horses? Is it purely scientific? Is it more integrative? How how do you think is 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 it working actually? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the work with the horses can be absolutely a part of a holistic approach to to wellness because yeah. you know certainly. Wellness involves physical, also emotional, spiritual, mental health, and so definitely the work with the horses is so um, amazing at bringing awareness to different, you know, aspects maybe of our um, oh maybe patterns or behaviors or um, you know uh, maybe nonverbal sort of. Um, communications that we are giving that we may not have previously been aware of. Um, I also think yeah. there's just a, a real value. Um, there's just such a healing power in forming connections with other beings, you know, that are obviously don't speak the same language or uh, any kind of verbal <laughs> language like we do, um, but feeling that deep sense of connection and, um, you know, and uh, I think that can open up uh, a lot of healing in people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and um, yeah, prob the the horse is communicating non verbally. It's a it's a non verbal animal, and um, some some people say that uh, the horse is kind of uh, uh, synchronizing with the the heartbeat, and the, there is this um, you know story. Uh, I don't know if it's scientifically proven, but anyway, I heard about it with uh, how you say uh, cardiac occurrence. Her, her the current with the frequency of the heart of the heart, mm -hmm. and um, and so uh, I know that some uh, some uh, practice of meditation are also acting on the heaven effect on the on the heart frequency. So um, would you say that uh, how, how do you relate the the, the meditation? and uh, the equine assisted learning and um, i know that in your paper you are mentioning meditation as one of the few uh, intervention that was already studied in the in medical students how, how do you think it relates with the with the horses yeah let me yes i will absolutely answer that let me back up a step and say that one of the the reasons that I, or, you know, when I was thinking about doing this work and how it could be helpful, um, I realized like a lot of the valuable things that we can learn from working with the horses can help with the really huge problem of 
um, burnout in the world of um, medical students, residents, and practicing physicians and other healthcare providers. Um, there, we have a, a you know pretty significant um, crisis uh, in the medical field with with burnout, depression, completed suicide. Um, physicians have the highest rate of completed suicide of, of any other um, profession, even higher than um, veterans, actually, which is astonishing. Um, yeah, and, that's, and that's so, incredible, almost uh, incredible. Yeah, and so, you know, I started to look into the literature um, related to, um, you know, and burnout is actually a, a risk factor for suicide in physicians. And so I started to look more into the, the literature about um, physician burnout and medical student burnout and, you know, well-being. And like you said, meditation was one of the, I mean, the, 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 the research in this is really in its infancy. So there's still, I think, so much that we don't understand and know. But yeah. um, in terms of people just starting to try different interventions, um, meditation was one of those interventions that was shown to be effective. Um, and so to your question, what does the work with the horses have um, maybe in common with meditation, I, I would say to that, I think that they both can be very useful in improving um, mindfulness in us. And so, you know, with, with meditation, um, we're sort of being still and kind of bringing our awareness to our thoughts and emotions and bodily sensations, you know, we're becoming more present um, we're doing that in a way, you know, we're, we're, we're practicing cultivating mindfulness um, from a stance that's hopefully non-reactive, non-judgmental, as John Kabat-Zinn would say. And I feel like with the horses, we're, we're um, one of the, the big focuses in the work with the horses that I had with the students in resident was, was that same um, concept of you know, really working to stop spinning around in our head, like we're so good at doing in the medical field, because, you know, our training is so much about knowledge acquisition, you know, how much do you know, and efficiency, and planning, and, you know, how to navigate your day in the most efficient way possible, and who you're seeing next, and what the problems are, and how you're going to fix them, <laughs> and yes. so we're always in our heads, so dropping back into the body, and being still, and aware, and then letting go of like criticism, judgment, you know, assumptions. It's so hard, it's so hard for us. And I, and it, you know, I am, I am a medical professional. It's hard for me too. So the work, you know, meditation and the work with the horses, um, I, I feel can be so beneficial um, in working toward that state. But I've noticed like when I worked with the students in residence, a lot of them would say, you know, they just had a really hard time with meditation, <laughs> with sitting still and, and I think because we're, we're like, go, go, go all the time, you know, in the field, it's like, see the next person, you get 15 minutes in the clinic to see this person, and then you're not, you know, you're on to the next one. And, and so it was really hard for them to slow down. And I think the work with the horses, um, they loved it, because now they're not just sitting and like, you know, for those that had a hard time with meditation, especially, they're actually doing an activity where they can cultivate mindfulness you know, where they feel like they're actually interacting with another being. So they're, they're having to pay attention to what's coming up in them and also how their, you know, actions and energy and nonverbal communications are affecting that other being, the horse. And then, and then you know, um, making adjustments in the moment. And then, you know, we had a big, we had a really big focus on approaching um, any sort of, challenges with curiosity um, instead of judgment. And so I love, you know, when, when Linda, um, when she trained us, yeah. she always started with what went well out there, you know? And so that yeah. was a big focus I kept because I really wanted them to, they're so critical of themselves. Oh yeah. And, and often when, um, when we would kind of just get to know each other at the beginning of the, um, the program, you know, several of my residents said, you know, one of the things I've noticed since starting residency is that um, I've just become so judgmental of, of myself, but I'm, I'm also, I've noticed I'm so judgmental of my colleagues, of others, you know, of my patients, 
um, it's like I just got into this sort of um, critical judgmental rut <laughs> and it's just spilling out everywhere. It's on, it's on me, it's on everybody around me. And so we really worked on, you know, if they were, um, when they would come out from an activity, you know, it was, it was, it was like, what, what went well? What challenges did you encounter? And then I would also step in and do some coaching or help when things seemed to really get stuck because I really wanted them to um, to have an experience where they felt like they um, they were able to achieve um, at least in some way you know get more toward the um, what they were working on um, achieving. But yeah, so there were a lot of really lovely elements that I think um, it really are about bringing mindfulness into what we are doing, uh, which translate very well back into their work with the, the patients and their colleagues. Yes, yeah. And uh, I, I, I was wondering, uh, how did you, um, how did you introduce the, the, the work with, with horses? How, do, how did you explain to them? And as, as you said, well, medical students everywhere uh, are, you know, go, go, no time, uh, organization, uh, planning, agenda, and, uh, so, so many patients to, to see, and so on, so And it's very self-judgmental, uh, as you said, but I, I was wondering, how, how, uh, how did you explain to them that they will have to spend one full day, several days doing um, doing um, nothing, <laughs> not doing anything, or, or slowing down, and, and at the same time, you know, they they have so many things to do and to learn and to so and to achieve. So uh, how how did you explain it to them, and what was what was the what was the challenges? How did they answer to it? And um, yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. It was actually really hard, especially for my first group of medical students, because this wasn't something they elected to do. It was part of, it was just a required part of their curriculum. And so they kind oh. of landed, <laughs> landed in it, like whether or not they wanted to be there. And, uh, and one of the feedbacks from that first um, program that I did, where I did allow a lot of breaks that were longer and um, a lot of time for processing was that they felt it didn't move fast enough, you know, like they were sort of still in this like go, go, go mode. And so I did have to make some modifications, you know, um, I moved through activities a little more quickly than what we did in our, um, in my training, because the, the group I'm working with is a very task oriented group. And so to take them from, you know, 100 miles an hour down to 30 miles an hour, that was too big a shift for them. <laughs> so we had to first go down to 60 and then 50 and then 40. So we kind of slowly got, you know, to where we could spend more time in that sort of contemplation, <laughs> um, just being sort of a state. But that was really, I mean, that's, that's hard for those of us who are used to going 100 miles an hour just to survive in our profession. Absolutely. And then in terms of the horse work, I, um, you know, I explained to them that this was a, you know, ex experiential learning. So that, you know, often that their patients are so polite, they might not feel empowered enough to tell them the truth when they, their interactions may be offensive or off-putting or confusing. But horses are so honest because, you know, they don't have those filters of needing to be polite. They don't worry about hurting our feelings or, you yeah. know, they're just kind of reacting in the moment to the way we're showing up and whether the directions we're providing are clear or not. Um, and so, you know, I, I told them, like, this isn't this isn't really about um, you doing the activities perfectly, but this is about us bringing more attention to how our um, behaviors and energy um, may be influencing those around us so that we can just be aware of it and then we can bring curiosity and an element of play and just yeah. try different things and notice the response of the horses. And so my, my emphasis was the horses are honest um, and this can help you, you know, shift if you, you know, uh, if there's something that you feel 
maybe um, you want to shift in your interactions with patients and colleagues to form better connections, better relationships, and have more conscious influence over, you know, maybe they'll follow your recommendations more effectively if they feel more connected and um, to you, you know, so that's how I, I wove it, you know, into something that I think matters to them. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. And uh, but actually, did did you did you see did you select uh, students that already had um, signs of of of, uh, of burnout or that were that were you know more stressed or that uh, or or you just uh, did did you yeah. have a special sample I mean or how, how did you That's proceed? Yeah, we did not select. We so all of the medical students. They were medical students from University of Iowa, and they did a community-based um, month-long rotation where they were going to different. They were doing a whole hodgepodge of different things where they would follow physical therapy for half a day or follow yeah. a nutritionist. And so we wove this program into that. So they came out one day a week for three weeks. So for three of those four weeks, so I had three full days with them. And, um, and it was all of them. So there was no sort of selection based on students they were concerned about experiencing more stress or more depression or more burnout at all. Okay, okay. Would, what, would you say that you had uh, more success with, with some of the students or were, were they more, what, what would you say about it? Because you, you've seen, yeah, basically I, you've seen all the students of your, of your faculty, of your university. <laughs> Uh, well, it was a, it was some of them. It wasn't all. It was it was those that were doing that rotation during the time of year when we could do the equine work outside. Yeah, so it was basically spring, summer, fall months. Okay. Um, but those that did it during the winter, we didn't do the equine work. But I did see it. You know, I think there were like 18 students that rotated through three at a time. Okay. And great. We did the work with three medical residents. But yes, I would definitely say um, it was. Uh, of course, in this work with any people. It's some are more receptive than others. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think, uh, you know, so some groups were a little bit uh, maybe more fun to work with than others, or, you know, maybe were, had more insight and more um, yeah. kind of were more open to, uh, to some of the making shifts if things weren't going well. And, um, and really connecting the dots back to how they show up with patients and families and colleagues. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I mean, I loved doing it overall, but certainly there were some groups or individuals that were a little more challenging. It, it's not fun. I mean, it's not fun when things don't go the way that the student or the resident is hoping for and they're getting frustrated. And, and I, you know, of course, that happened with me, as you know, many times. And so certainly I have a lot of, um, you know, compassion when that's happening. Um, but but some of the really hard stuff would come up, of course. And so, um, you know, this because we, we in the medical field, we tend to be so focused on the outcome, you know. Yeah, we, absolutely. We want the outcome that we want, you know. And, yeah. and this was more about we're going to really focus on the process, um, oh, well. you know. Are you in your body? You know, um, is the direction you're providing clear? Like we're going to approach it with with curiosity if things aren't going well, and and a lot of self compassion because you guys have never worked with horses at all. So of course, you know, things aren't going to be going, <laughs> you know, the way that that you think they should be a lot of the time, and that's okay. Um, this is about um, play and um, awareness and uh, and growth, and so yeah, it was. It was uh, it was a really good growth opportunity for me too. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, for for sure. I, I can I can imagine I can imagine, and um, uh, so and I, I I know you um, you sent me uh, pictures of the students working with horses and uh, yeah and it looks it looks awesome actually and. Um, do you have any uh, stories? Yeah. Or, uh, how how did how did it work? Did, did... Oh sure, yeah. So <laughs> it was so fun. I wrote a whole curriculum, and then um, you know the students had three full days. The internal medicine residents that this was an elective for them. 
And yeah. so they had actually two weeks um, where they came out for three days a week. So I had six full days with them. And so we could, you know, we could do activities more than once. We could go a little more in depth into things, which was a lot of fun. So the way it worked in general was um, we would do like a kind of a didactic piece, which was more, um, sometimes it was a formal uh, talk. I had a, you know, talk about like burnout, for example, the problem of burnout. And then we'd have conversation and uh, dialogue about that and how they, you know, saw that in themselves and their colleagues. And um, and then we'd go and we'd do like an activity. Um, you know, we'd talk in the, the, the discussion about, you know, some of the, like meditation, for example, some of the things that have been shown in the field of positive psychology to combat burnout and um, mm -hmm. practicing gratitude. You know, so we, I, I wanted them to have some tangible things that they could um, practice during the selective um, or their, their sessions. And so I would assign homework as well, you know, like tonight I want you, um, and until we see each other again, I want you to each night write down three things specific from your day that you're grateful for. Or I yeah. want you to, to try, let's just try like do five minutes of meditation tonight. You know, let's do it together here so you know what it is. And then let's have you go home and practice at home. But in general, after each didactic session, um, we would go out and do a horse activity that had some relevance to that didactic session that we had just done. And so um, we did a lot of different horse activities. Um, you know, one of the ones that seemed to have the greatest impact on them, which is really ironic. Well, I'll talk about two or maybe three because <laughs> I love talking about this. Um, one of them was I just I had them like the weather didn't always cooperate. So I wanted some activities we could do like maybe in the barn that where they didn't have to be out in the rain. So um, one of those was just lifting up the foot of, you know, the horse or the miniature donkey. And, um, you know, I had, so when they weren't able to lift the hoof up for some reason, if the horse wasn't picking it up, instead of them like kind of going down that rabbit hole, you know, the tendency was like, well, they're just not doing it or, you know, I'm not good enough or I can't get them to do that. So it was like, okay, well, let's just, let's just be curious about it. I wonder why they might not be picking that foot up. Oh, look, are, are they shifted? Is there weight on the foot you're trying to ask them to lift up? What if you just notice where their weight is and then you ask for the other foot first? You might have a better chance of success there. Um, or what if, how can we get them to shift their weight off that foot if that's the one you really want to pick up? So we asked by, you know, asking them to take a step back. Um, so it was like, it was like engaging them in problem solving and curiosity. Um, I had this little miniature donkey <laughs> named Vino, yes. and he actually had arthritis in his shoulder. And so it was pretty, it was pretty severe. And so he often would not want to shift weight onto that leg. Yeah. And so, you know, when he wouldn't, he wouldn't pick up um, his left foot because he didn't want to put weight into his right front leg because it hurt. And so that was another element that, that I was able to share with him. Like, you don't know this about him, that this is why he's resisting so much. It is really hard for him to shift weight off that foot you're asking him to give you. It's yeah. not he's being belligerent or difficult or non-compliant. It hurts. And, you know, and so then we would talk afterward. How do you relate this back to your, your patients? You know, you have that patient that's labeled as non-compliant, right? They never yes. follow your recommendations or anybody's recommendations. They just keep coming back to the ER. It's so frustrating, yes. you know, and, and we tend to just judge and sort of, you know, I mean, it's frustrating. It is. And yeah. so we didn't know that. Um, but also, what if you what if you just brought some curiosity and some compassion to that? Like, you know, maybe they're not sharing with you the truth about why they're not following your recommendations. Maybe they can't follow that you know, um, healthy diet you're recommending because they live in a literal like food desert, you know, or maybe their food comes from the gas station or the McDonald's and that's all they really have available. Or, you know, maybe they can't afford that medication, um, their insurance, they can't even afford the $10 copay, maybe, you know, so there's just, it was, we had really good discussions after this. And this seemed to be one of the activities that had the biggest impact on the students that came up in their evaluation. Um, Another activity, do I have time to talk about a couple more activities and how it? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, that's uh, very, very interesting. And they are so practical and, uh, and uh, yeah, and, it, and uh, that there is curiosity, there is observation. Yeah, it's, it's um, really, yeah. really interesting.
Please go on. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so another activity um, we did that was so amazing was you mentioned um, the coherent breathing, like shifting our our nervous system into a state of balance. You know, we're so often in our sympathetic, we're just sort of all over the place in our minds and we're, you know, maybe stressed and um and so um I actually uh taught them this coherent breathing technique, which I would consider to be a mindfulness or almost like a meditation technique. It's a it's a breath work technique, but it it's something that you do um you know, where you also element of love and gratitude and joy as you're doing the breath work. And so um, it was a great way of kind of shifting them into a state of positive emotions and making their breath very even and regular. And I, I bought the M-Wave monitors, which is a biofeedback device oh, yeah. that I'm very familiar with, Sylvan, um, which actually measures um, their heart, something called heart rate variability, which is the beat to beat variation in, in the heart beats. And we'll tell them with a change in color when they are achieving what we call a state of coherence, which is when their parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system is in a state of balance and harmony. Um, that's a considered a state of, of, you know, it's a very healthy state to be in. And so this was awesome because um, I just started doing this. It was kind of like I was just playing with it myself. I didn't know what the outcome would be, but I I taught them to do this. And then I had a horse who was sort of an older um, previous show jumper who came from a, a, a school horse. Uh, he was a school horse and really like highly um, anxious kind of uh, horse who would get really you know, upset if he was separated from his mare. Yeah. And in the beginning when I had him, I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do anything with this horse with the student because he's, he's so, like, it's so hard for him to be away by himself in the round pit. But I started doing this coherent right. breathing and he just responded. It was incredible. He'd be like pacing and pacing and calling out. And I would just start to do the breathing and he would stop pacing. And his big head would swing around and look at me. And if I kept doing it and kept doing it, he would come and walk to me and just drop his head. Um, and so I had the students do this and I had them wear the monitor so they could, you know, and I would just say to them, the goal isn't necessarily to have the horse walk to you. The goal is just to notice, your goal is to do the breathing, to notice what color the monitor is. Is it red, which means you're in a state of incoherence, you haven't yet achieved the state of coherence. Is it blue, which means you're heading in the right direction. It's getting close, you know, you're, you're, you're coming into a state of coherence or is it green, which means you've achieved a state of coherence. You're in a state of coherence. And then at the same time, just glance up and notice what the horse is doing. And so amazingly, student after student, I mean, I'm not kidding you, 22, 23, or no, yeah, times in a row, every single time, if they were red, he would not have anything to do with them over on the other side of the round pin. If they would go into blue, you'd start to see his head come around. Like he could feel the shift. It was amazing. And if once they went into green, here comes old Blitz, you know, walking on over. And then he would just come and stand beside him. And they, they would come out of the round pin. The students would come out of the round pin. They were, I mean, one of the, my most cynical, skeptical medical residents, male yeah. medical residents, he came back and was like, he was like, whoa, I'm not going to lie. He's like, I'm kind of freaked out right now. <laughs> so it really had an impact. It was like they could totally see then, you know, that there was something going on. Like when they were able to shift their energy, their state inside of them, that impacted that force. And, and that meant to them that our energy is felt by those around us. And as humans, Maybe we aren't quite as sensitive as the horses. I don't know, but we do feel when other people are in a state of maybe not such a lovely energy to be around. We don't. We feel that. You know, it influences us, and so that was really good for them because they then could think like, ah. So when I walk into a patient room, if I'm in a state of stress and frantic, like you know, anxiety, and I'm thinking about all the stuff I need to do that I haven't got done yet that's going to influence whether that patient can really, you know, 
feel comfortable being near me and listening, you know, connected and listening to what I have to say. So that was a really powerful exercise. And I was so glad, you know, they're very, they're very much about data. So like if they hadn't been wearing the monitor, I, I think it wouldn't have been as powerful because for them, they needed the proof <laughs> um, to say like, you know, when I'm red, the horse doesn't come. When I'm green, the horse comes, you know, over and over and over again. So yeah, that was really amazing to experience that with them. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Of myself, I've been doing this this uh, experiment numerous time, numerous time. That when when uh, when you are in this this state, uh, probably it has something to do with the the heart. I don't know exactly what is the scientific. Um, what what is the evidence? What is the exactly what was the the process of it? But as as a fact of observation, uh, almost every time the horse is joining up and sometimes even joining in the circle of the, the the people, and it's as as you say, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, and I'm I'm glad to hear that that story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was pretty neat. And he became, you know, the irony of that is here I thought I had gotten this horse that I wasn't going to be able to use at all with the students. And he became like the cornerstone of the whole program. Like this was his gift was teaching them. Yeah, the power of their their inner state of being and their influence that has on those around them. Sylvan, I can't hear you all of a sudden. Yeah, so th now I can. can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so thank you for sharing all those uh, beautiful stories. And uh, and of course, in the medical field, we like everything to be proven and to be evidence-based. So I, I don't know, maybe there is going to be some uh, evidence, maybe with uh, cardiac currents. I, I don't know. I don't know exactly. And uh, I've seen at Linda Kohanov uh, last week, I was in Tucson, Arizona, and I've seen horses actually with a, a sensor belt where you could measure the, the heartbeat of the horse. And it seems that it's kind of related with the human. Yeah. So probably there is some uh, ongoing uh, research to, to be done. And, Absolutely. Uh, and I don't know. And, and uh, what, how, how, do you, how do you see the, the future? of all this field, especially in the, in the medical field and uh, with students, with medical doctors, with uh, all kinds of, uh, of uh, medical doctors and medical staff. Yeah, I think it can be really beneficial, um, you know, in that um, thinking about, you know, the causes of burnout, for example, I think there's been this kind of uh, divide about people who think it's system issues like work hours, um, too much paperwork, and then people who think it's like, well, internal characteristics, personality traits that those of us who go into the field tend to have, um, you know, like really conscientious, kind of type A overachiever, <laughs> perfectionist, <laughs> hardworking, you know. Um, Anyway, but I, I think it's probably both. And I, but I, I think to change the system, which I think is a, it's a big problem. Um, for example, you know, the overwork in the medical field is, is ridiculous. It's huge. Um, I think, I think I saw something that said 40% or it's like 60% of physicians work more than 50 hours a week and 40 percent are working more than 60 hours a week every week which is yes. you know this is not sustainable for most i think for most people um but i think to be able to influence you know we're part of that culture <laughs> if i'm if i'm being completely honest um we uh you know when you grow up in that system where that's the expectation uh and, and then you kind of that becomes part of your identity. Like, am I, am I, am I dedicated enough? Am I, you know, am I a hard worker? Am I, you know, am I a good enough, you know, physician? And um, I, I think we have to shift things in ourselves in order to advocate effectively to shift and change the system in which we practice medicine. And so I think the equine assisted learning work is, 
is can be enormously helpful because you can also learn from working with horses to to set boundaries um, without getting angry about it. Just to to be assertive, um, you know, to advocate for change uh, requires being assertive. But I think it's most productive when it's done in a way that's not angry and aggressive, right? Because then people are like, yeah. "Oh, you're like, crazy," so <laughs> I'm not listening to you. So I think working with the horses can really help people develop those skills. Um, you know, it can shift things within us that can help us shift how we can advocate for change within the system. I'd love to see it be more utilized. Um, I think some of the challenges to that are, you know, um, it's so out of the box for physicians and um, healthcare providers to even think that working with horses might benefit them in some way. Um, I think getting funding for for medical education initiatives um, like equine assisted learning is always a challenge. Um, yes. The medical education is always underfunded. And so to add something new uh, where, you know, really you're working with relatively small groups at a time. I mean, I, I think that um, the cost can be an issue uh, at times. And then, you know, just buy in from administrators and um, program directors and things who maybe have never uh, known about equine assisted learning or why why it's valuable how it's valuable so yeah i think it could be a, a great addition i it's just uh kind of in its infancy within the medical field you you mentioned the the ability of the horse to uh, set boundaries not in an aggressive way and uh, did, did you mean that um, we we have to learn how to set boundaries within ourselves or what what was your idea when you were mentioning this this horse ability setting boundaries yeah. when when we when we look at horses for sure they they do they do not hesitate they they tell the the other horse you you have to stay this this is my, my boundary this is my private space so i, I was wondering what what way are you uh, thinking about with uh, the boundaries uh, yeah i think I think it starts with ourselves, um, and that is what I was thinking about, because I feel like, um, you know, we t in healthcare, we tend to be, um, you know, we're nurturers, so we want to, you know, we give and we give and we want to, we feel bad because these people are sick. But, you know, in, in the healthcare field, um, of, of course, it's not their fault. They will take as much as we will give. <laughs> and so I think we have to start with looking at ourselves. We're all individuals what amount of work hours can I reasonably reasonably accommodate and, and also take care of myself and feel well, you know? Um, and that might require for me, I um, eventually uh, shifted into working part-time. That was incredibly hard for me to do because of my ego, where I was very identified with, I'm a hard worker, you know, I'm, I'm a strong physician. Um, asking to work part-time when I don't have kids that felt just incredibly, um, you know, I had to get through that um, feeling that, oh, you have no right to do that. So it took yeah. a lot of, um, you know, it takes courage, I think, to recognize your own limitations and really advocate for yourself and um, sort of, you know, even sometimes insist on it. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not necessarily going to be applauded by your administration or your colleagues even um, when you do that. I mean, I think there's a real element of um you know kind of shaming and, and blaming those in the healthcare field who want a reasonable work week <laughs> um or who who do set boundaries um and aren't just you know giving more than um what they really maybe can be and staying well so yeah so i definitely to answer your question yes i think it it's really about learning to set healthy boundaries for ourselves um and i think if we all learn to do that um, the system, the culture of the practice of medicine will have to shift. Yes. Well, so, so many insights. Um, and, uh, well, thank you very much, Nicole. And, um, so we, we are slowly, uh, getting to the, to the, the wrap up of this, uh, this interview. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's. I think it's really awesome what 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 you did with the medical students and uh, yeah. And as you said, the, the, there is an issue 
everywhere, everywhere, uh, with uh, the the caregivers, the medical doctors, and the burnout is is everywhere. I think the statistics in France is, as you said, I think it's sixty percent. So, yeah. uh, and and it can it can get you know it's a spiral that can get you into depression. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, so uh, if uh, if we find this uh, useful way of setting boundaries, as as uh, you said, it's it's some kind of a public health issue, I would say. And um, yeah, and, uh, thank you for um, uh, telling us about your study. Uh, and uh, maybe I can mention that the study itself is uh, online. It's on the Sage, and uh, and uh, you can find it. At, at, I put the the link on the on the video. Um, and so uh, maybe you you have some uh, final remarks or uh, or anything you learned with the with the horses doing this uh, this fantastic work. At, uh, with medical students and with health professionals. Oh, I um, well, I just appreciate you having me uh, on to talk about it. Yeah, I really, I've loved, um, really loved doing this work with the students and the residents and the physicians. And I know the horses have been such a valuable um, part of my own personal growth. And yeah. um, and so, yeah, I I, uh, I hope to see the work utilized more and more in the medical field in the future. Yeah. Well, that's something we both uh, wish, and I really hope that uh, this interview will help. And uh, uh, that's a growing field everywhere. And, uh, and thank you very much for telling about uh, all you did in the in the U.S. And uh, you, you told me that there are several other uh, scientific studies that are being done in the in the U.S. I know that in France, some studies are in preparation, especially with uh, with the, the, the trauma, the, the, the post trauma. And I hope that uh, we will be able to talk more about it, maybe with the polyvagal theory that is connected with the with the, the, the post traumatic syndrome. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And thank you very much once uh, once more. Um, oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm glad you're doing this online summit. <laughs> with pleasure. See you soon. Bye-bye, okay. Nicole. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.